Thousands of British Columbians, many of them from minority communities, have been protesting against OG123, which was originally introduced by the BC United Liberals. Parents are concerned about the sexualization of their children in this NDP government's education system. Will the minister admit that SOGI 123 has been divisive, an assault on parents' rights, and a distraction on student education? Premier. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker, and uh, I welcome the member uh, to, the, to the House as the leader of, uh, of his new party. But I've got to say, this is not an auspicious start. You know, when you talk about the issues of the day for British Columbians, cost of living, housing, we heard from the BCUP, health care, addiction, mental health, to, to come into this place, to use the authority of his office, uh, his new party, to find a small group of kids in our province, to, to leverage all of that to make them feel less safe at school, less safe in our community, to, to feed the fires of division in our province and bring culture war to British Columbia, it is not welcome. And when he sat on this side of the house, he supported those same policies, Honourable Chair. It is outrageous that he would stand here and do this. He sees political advantage in picking on kids and families and teachers and schools who are just trying to do their best for kids who are at risk of suicide, Honourable Chair. Shame on him. Choose another question. Choose another question. That's what the Premier of British Columbia thought was an appropriate response to this MLA following his question. And for my non-Canadian viewers, an MLA is a member of the Legislative Assembly, which means that this man was elected by the people in his riding to represent them, to bring hard questions and to demand answers from their government, and that's exactly what he is trying to do in this so-called democracy, and he was completely shut down by the BC Premier uh, for a asking a very legitimate question. Now, the first time I ever heard about this guy was just a few days ago, as this BC Conservative leader was criticized for comparing uh, parental rights to residential schools. And I must say, I thought his tweet was pretty brilliant and, and pretty on point. Just a few days ago, he said, Today is National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, or Orange Shirt Day. Today, we remember what happens when the Canadian government thinks it's better at raising children than parents. I will always stand with parents. A very, very good point. And of course, they criticize him for saying that they're comparing this to, you know, uh, the sexual orientation and gender identity that's being taught in schools. Uh, but Rastad denies that he is making these comparisons to Soji123, arguing that his statement is historically accurate. I'm not comparing that. What I'm talking about is the fact that what happened with the Canadian government interfering and making a decision that they knew best in terms of children's education and taking away those rights from parents obviously led to very tragic results, he said. And again, I, I couldn't agree with him uh, more about this statement in regards to parental rights. And guys, by the way, if you do want to learn more about what actually happened, please watch my video, The Truth, about Canada's National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Well, now, it seems that he's kind of doubling down on this point that he was making, uh, now saying that parents are very concerned about the sexualization of their children. And as you saw in that opening clip, he simply asked, will the minister admit that SOGI123 has been divisive, an assault on parental rights and a distraction on student education? Again, a very, very legitimate question. And uh, as you saw in that opening clip, and as we will discuss, he was completely shut down, which, as I said, should prove to you that democracy is an absolute sham. But of course, that begs the question, if that's the case, well then, what's the alternative, right? Well, guys, we're going to talk about all of that and much more in this video. But really quickly, just before we do, I'd ask that you check me out here at pressfortruth.ca slash donate if you appreciate my efforts to bring you this information. Here you can do a one-time donation with PayPal. You can do Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies by clicking there. You can join me on Subscribestar for a monthly reoccurring contribution. Five bucks a month, ten bucks a month, whatever is within your means is greatly appreciated. Thank you so much to everybody who does take time to support in that way. Uh, you can also send an e-transfer to dan at pressfortruth.ca or if you guys like to keep things old school, you can send stuff to my P.O. box, guys. 
Links for all of this are located in the description below. Once again, thank you so much to everybody who does take the time and efforts to support my work here at Press for Truth. All right, guys. So, again, as you saw from that opening clip, uh, this man has a very legitimate question about Soji123 being taught to young children in schools here in British Columbia. In fact, I had the exact same question that this MLA had for the leader of the Conservative Party. I thought it was an appropriate question to ask uh, Pierre uh, Polyev, or however the heck you pronounce his name, as he learns from Dan Dix about Soji and is also asked to define what a woman is. You know, I, I think it's important to get these things on the record from people who are, uh, you know, leaders of our so-called democracy. So let's check that out real quick. Um, let me see if I can find that moment. Let's see, I think it was right up around here somewhere. And I'll show you this. And all this time, just ask you two, two quick questions. Um, I was curious. Are, 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 are yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, should kids as young as five years old be taught like gender ideology and s sexual orientation in school? No. Boom. So, should children as young as five years old be taught sexual orientation and gender identity in schools? No. He says, remember, this is the potential future, uh, you know, pr uh, prime minister of the country. We now have it on the record how he feels about Soji. And then I find out that he doesn't even know what it is. So I explain it to no. him. Okay. Oh, because I thought you were in favor of the Soji in Vancouver. What's the Soji? What's Soji? Oh, sexual orientation, gender identification is what they're teaching. Again, this is the man who's representing uh, the uh, opposition to the uh, official leadership who doesn't even know what Soji123 is. This is a real concern among parents uh, in British Columbia and across all of the nation, obviously. We just saw that million people march for children. You know, this is obviously a huge issue. And um, so this is why I asked the leader of the Conservative Young Party. children in, in British Columbia. I don't know anything about that. That's about my, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a federal <laughs> politician, so I'm not involved in the provincial. Yeah, I don't know anything about that. You know, I deal with feder issues on the federal issue. And this is a B BC thing, you know. But it's like, guess what? This is going to become a federal issue. This is already highly uh, uh, d d divisive and politicized, and it, it will be a topic you're going to have to take a side on in the future. So, curriculum. getting it on the okay, record. Okay, final question. Um, this is going around a lot in the U.S. A lot of people aren't able to answer it, apparently. Um, and can you, in three or four words, define what a woman is? Simple question. Define what a woman is. I'm surprised he had never even heard this question. He seems caught off guard, and he jokingly says, you know, hey, if you have to ask that kind of question, I mean, hey, what's wrong with you, right? I mean, but <laughs> you have to ask that <laughs> you might want to get yourself a dictionary. or. A, I'm uh, just curious to hear yeah, your, 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 your definition in two I, or three words, three or four <laughs> words. I'm sorry, yeah. we, we just have a huge lineup still. So, so, yeah. yeah. Can you you he really doesn't, so I try again. Can you define a woman? Define a woman? Not a man. Not a man. Yeah. Not a a man. And uh, I would say that's an acceptable answer, but again, it's important to get these things on the record, like I did with the uh, potential future pr uh, prime minister of the country. And so uh, here we have a, a an elected representative, a member of the Legislative Assembly of British Columbia, attempting to represent the people of his riding, uh, concerned parents about the curriculum being taught in the schools. And the response, as you saw, was disgusting. He goes, to come to, into this place and to use the authority of this office for his new party to find a small group of kids in our province to leverage all of that, to make them feel less safe, less safe in our community, to feed the fires of division in our province and to bring culture war to British Columbia is not welcome. What is this lunatic going on about? He is simply raising the concerns that, legitimate concerns, that parents have with the sexual nature of the curriculum being taught to young children. It's absolutely insane. And again, this should be a huge uh, um, red flag for people to realize that when your elected representatives cannot even bring up uh, specific points that are of concerns to the parents of the people that he's representing. You know we're not in a in a true democracy here. Uh, what we have is, is a sham. You know it, it's the illusion of of choice. It's 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 two wings of the same bird. It, it's it's two sides of the same coin. 
It's a choreographed wrestling match. And I've been saying that for, for so many years, and people often ask me the question, especially after I put this out back in 2015, when I was trying to warn people about Justin Trudeau. You know, I, I wasn't on Rumble and Bitchute and all that stuff, Odyssey, back then. It was only on YouTube, so um, that has been deleted. Um, but back then, uh, when I put out the Democracy Deception, explaining that it's, it, it's the money changers, it's the cartel of banking insiders, the, 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 the banking dynasty families uh, whose inheritances date back centuries and who in, manipulated everybody through wars and, and for, through the setting up of fiat con currencies, they are the ones who are responsible for the idea of democracy itself and have turned it into this illusion of choice. But again, this begs the question, what's the alternative? Well, folks, <laughs> I put a lot of time and effort into thinking about just that. In fact, I did put it out in a video almost five years ago now. Uh, part two of the democracy deception, what's the alternative? Um, democracy is just the deception that we are somehow progressing just because we vote, when really, democracy is just another version of communism. And like any communist state, the erosion begins with the family. In this video, Dan Dix of Press for Truth goes over the various pros and cons of what may someday replace democracy, but more importantly, how traditional morals, specifically Christian morals, standards, and values, need to make a strong comeback before we can ever achieve any kind of a libertarian or anarchist utopia. So I want to leave you with that today, ladies and gentlemen. I put a lot of time and thought and effort into that particular video. I've had a lot of new subscribers and new followers here at Press for Truth over the years, so there's a good chance you haven't seen this uh, breakdown of mine on uh, why democracy needs to re be replaced and what could potentially replace it in the future. So uh, I want to leave you with that today, guys. The Democracy Deception Part 2, what's the, what's the alternative? Um, and also, once again, if you do appreciate my efforts to bring you with all this information, don't forget to check me out here at pressfortruth.ca slash donate. Thank you so much to everybody who has taken the time and will take the time today to support my efforts at Press for Truth. And uh, that's all for today, guys. So I want to leave you with this video that I put an awful lot of time and effort into almost five years ago now. So there's a chance you haven't seen it. Even if you have seen it, give it another watch because it contains a lot of really solid information. So uh, without further ado, this is the Democracy Deception Part 2. What's the alternative? This is Dan Dix here reporting for Press for Truth with an important message here on the eve of our federal selection. And that is, the system isn't broken, my friends. The system is fixed. Democracy is the deception that we are somehow progressing just because we vote, when in reality, democracy is really just another version of communism. And like with any communist state, the erosion begins with the family. Parents aren't raising their children anymore. The state is. And public schooling really is just the indoctrination of our youth. And now, when the youth rebel against the establishment, what they're fighting for is bigger, badder establishment. Children are, despite the cliché, the future, and the state knows this. As the state has eroded the family through mandatory indoctrination centers, they've also attacked the family structure by overly empowering women and by destroying the purchasing power of the money. Those two tenants sent women into the workplace, further diminishing a child's experience with the governance of a patriarchal family. I mean, the family itself is a small, self-contained governing unit, and the child comes first. And how children are raised will determine their immediate outlook post-family life when they reach adulthood. The problem, of course, is cultural Marxism which should be more accurately called cultural Gramicism, since it originates with the communist Antonio Gramsci. While in prison, Gramsci wrote his famous prison notebooks, which described how to erode Western values like Christianity and family. Karl Marx, however, believed that basic material factors influenced history, and culture was a part of the superstructure. So technically it's wrong to attack the culture, we're supposed to just sit and wait for the inevitable communist revolution. But just as capitalism hasn't impoverished the working class, in fact, it's done just the opposite, Marx's theory that culture comes later is also flawed. 
Instead of intellectuals taking up arms and physically fighting the state for power, Western communist intellectuals have taken up high positions in universities and public schools. Throughout the 20th century, this group praised actual tyrannies, like the Soviet Union or Mao's China. They militarized feminism and other equality rights groups. They attacked the language. They invented political correctness and developed the idea of a microaggression, which claims that the very language we use is by default racist, sexist, and violent. The real tyranny, according to these Western intellectuals, is not coming from the barrels of the communist guns, but it's coming from the West and its bourgeoisie culture. The cultural march throughout the institutions has turned the patriarchy into an enemy. That is, the traditional family unit, the moral and ethical standards of Jesus Christ, private property, and capitalism. And this isn't to say that women shouldn't own property or that past patriarchal societies were free of aggression. On the contrary, these societies also had states and the Christian churches were rarely a beacon for liberty. But these past beliefs have led Western civilization through the ages as the most successful cultural traditions and norms. And far from the white heterosexual males being the enemy of society, people should be thanking them. A large majority of any unit of any technical value, like innovations and inventions and machineries and tools and everything we're using every day everywhere, and which our current living standards largely depend on, originate from Western values. It's not just free markets that bring about freedom. There's a cultural march that we have to reverse that will allow for the restoration of the traditional standards and values of Western society. And that is the teachings of Christ, which says to love one another. Don't lie and murder and cheat and steal. The only way to do this realistically is to restore the institutions of private property that recognizes the individual as a political sovereign. Not just white males, but all individuals of all races and ages and genders. But one doesn't go about this by voting for a political party. And now the counter-enlightenment ideas embraced by the Western intellectuals and now successfully embedded into the population is at the heart of this corporate cultural wasteland. Moral relativism, that is the idea that there are no universal moral laws, is now generally accepted as being true. Reason and logic are no longer the chief source of knowledge. An extreme scientism has taken hold, where everything, including reason and logic, must be empirically tested in the real world of things. Where the only thing that's valid and true is whatever is published in a peer-reviewed journal of official opinion, or checked by a computer model that gives the answers they want. This erosion of Western science is a direct result of the democratic tyranny where scientists live off of public funding. They too have become mouthpieces for the establishment, echoing the conclusions that are going to give the state more power. The state also created perverse incentives like the welfare state, which promotes dependency on bureaucracy and taxpayer money rather than the family tree. For example, a woman who's pregnant out of wedlock and relying on her parents or aunts and uncles or siblings. She wouldn't be just a single mom with a child. She would have those broader family foundations and the child would be better off because of it. With the welfare state, the mother becomes dependent on the state for financial benefits and the child ends up being raised outside of a family, missing all of the good morals and values that come with that. They're instead raised by other children their age in public schools headed by bureaucrats. So through direct state action and through corporate state propaganda, the powers that be have dismantled the family and replaced it with cultural Marxism. Guys, the family is the essential foundation of society and no amount of voting is ever going to change that. Canada's parliamentary democracy technically isn't broken, although it's not worth going back to after this experiment with cultural Marxism. And even so, under a patriarchal family private property order, the role of government would be so small that parliament might work. But since we live with people who have communist ideas and people are always going to have these ideas, the best way to limit their power is to just abolish democracy altogether and discredit it as an idea just as bad as communism. Democracy just can't work 
It's a nice idea, but human nature prevents it from working. But to understand how the cultural Marxists took control, how they marched through the institutions instead of having an armed revolution, to understand that, we have to go back to how Parliament was supposed to work. Democracy was originally a small liberal idea, and there's a lot of truth seekers out there who love democracy, and I really can't blame them. I mean, the conditioning is extremely tight. The power elite have engineered a multi-generational culture here that masks the realities of the corporate state apparatus and what the real solution should be. Now, traditionally under this kind of system, Canadian Parliament is considered sovereign and the only true voice of the people. As part of the march, organizations and associations, especially politically active ones, claim to speak for all the people. Women, unions, dispensaries, taxpayers, whoever. But only Parliament, at least on paper, is supposed to be the supreme representative institution. God is sovereign, who appoints the Queen, who allows us to have Parliament. Wait, you lost me after God is sovereign. In the United States, at least on paper anyways, the individual was sovereign. But the Civil War put an end to the idea that individual states could secede. That the individual could travel the continent when one state became more tyrannical than the other. Lincoln's war ended the authority of the state vis-a-vis -vis his centralized federal tyranny. Add the Federal Reserve and cultural Marxism, and you can see where America went wrong. And it was right after Lincoln's war that Canada became a country. The founders of Canada, especially the provincial legislatures that ratified the Constitution, correctly blamed the American war on too many democratic tendencies within the Republic. Most colonial provinces had their government, which they had been working with for years. It was just another form of democracy. The idea embedded in the Canadian Constitution is that it blends monarchical, democratic, and aristocratic elements. That's what makes it superior to the runaway democracy in the United States. What's interesting about the Canadian system is that with each new parliament, there's supposed to be a fresh new sheet. Once Justin Trudeau received his majority government, he theoretically could have taken the country in any direction that he wanted. Parliamentary sovereignty is basically a dictatorship for whoever controls the levers. And this power has tended to congregate in the Prime Minister's office. Even the Supreme Court of Canada is checked by Parliament's notwithstanding clause. But this power is almost never exercised in the way that it was envisioned. Justin Trudeau is not a dictator because his power is checked by these institutions that hold public sway. This group of Western communist intellectuals are preventing any kind of radical change from happening under their watch. Not that Trudeau was ever going to be much of a problem. The West has been hijacked by communists. Neoconservative Trotskyites hold on to political power and wage war. Worldwide proletarian revolution, making the world safe for democracy. While cultural Marxists dominate the institutions that were once thought of as civil society. Pierre Elliott Trudeau was a polarizing figure, but in this light, his actions can be seen as negative. Not only did he sign off the Bank of Canada to the international banking cartel, but he also enacted the War Measures Act. He befriended some communists, and then he enacted the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Just go through this charter and read what the government grants you, even when it means taking it from someone else. Spoiler alert, there's no right to private property. Instead, the Charter closely resembles the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, a multilateral treaty adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in 1966. The Charter, my friends, is a globalist document that reflects cultural Marxism. There's no such thing as free speech, only private property. There is no freedom of assembly because we can't choose to stop paying our taxes. We can't procure ourselves a free market. A judge, a lawyer, maybe even a police officer. The entire arboration system is monopolized by the state. And Trudeau's charter really just empowers the courts to the benefit of the lawyers and judges. We now have a system where judges, if they so choose, wield just as much power that was reserved for parliament and for parliament only. In one sense, this isn't all bad because courts have used this power to uphold individual rights when Parliament encroaches on them. But since they are operating under the guidelines of the Charter, which doesn't recognize property, 
judges' rulings have and will protect entitlements and absurd positive rights like economic rights. These Western intellectuals have access to endless amounts of data representing human activity. It's just an onslaught of noise of what we buy, where we bought it, when we bought it, the things we want and need, and on and on. And anyone can draw any conclusion they want from looking at this data. Like if I had 24 hour surveillance of your house, I could probably edit together a pretty funny video, but it would be completely out of context. That's what the Western communists are doing. They're correlating a high standard of living with government control. They'll say you need to have a decent standard of living in order to flourish in a capitalist order. And in order to do that, they have to have laws like basic income. Canadian courts, thankfully, has been hesitant in this area, referring some of these matters back to Parliament. Yet all it takes is for one person or coalition to sue the government and keep winning court battles. While court cases have facts and logic on their side compared to the democratic tyranny of politics, the judicial arena is predicated on that globalist document, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which has no right to private property. As Canada adopted more Marxist ideas like state-imposed multiculturalism and neoconservative free trade, international treaties, organizations, and tribunals have eclipsed Parliament's power. And in an even greater sense, overriding domestic institutions of law and order for an unelected global bureaucracy. Globalization is a manifestation of a communist dream for an international command and control economy. And atheism, rather than being imposed in a top-down fashion like in the Soviet Union, is being openly and voluntarily adopted by the masses. As public institutions and private businesses merge, the entrepreneurs disappear and the standard of living drops. Monopoly becomes the order of the day, as every bit of your personal life becomes bureaucratized and every single business transaction is a matter for the state. Agenda 21, now known as Agenda 2030, is the communist plan for the 21st century. It gives the state the power to centrally control and plan every single aspect of the economy while imposing culture and institutional ideas that go beyond attacking the family and Christian values and capitalism. Already we're seeing a fetishism for the environment and for animals and a strong dislike for human productivity and a desire to see more state control over resources. It's like embracing all of the impoverishing things that go along with communism and calling it a good thing. So how do we avoid the track we're on? If democracy is a deception, then where's the clarity? Well, the original intent behind Parliament was that it secured the rights and the freedoms that Canadians already had. My friends, we're free because we're born free. Governments take care of law and order because free markets can't. And the rest, we leave up to civil society. But it's a false paradigm that some things are public goods while others are private goods. There's nothing unique about government where it can tax or borrow or print money to try and make everyone richer. In a very practical and important sense, there's really no difference between taxation and theft. From experience, we know that government central plans fail when compared to free markets and entrepreneurship. The solution to this democratic question is that this logic must also extend to law and order and healthcare and every other thing that Canadians take as de facto government services. The solution is a private property order where all adult actions is voluntary and consensual. Of course, this isn't the only solution. In fact, it poses a problem for a culture that has undergone a cultural Marxist revolution. A libertarian society is often portrayed as a free-for-all, and not as in as, as if warlords will take over, although that is true as well. But where there might be a group of culturally conservatives in one area, and a group of communists in another. But this won't happen, simply because, as history shows, the culturally conservatives are morally and economically superior to the culturally materialistic communists. The latter will simply just fade away or have to be physically removed. After all, if one is espousing communist and democratic ideals in my community and to my children, then he's guilty of threatening my private property and family. 
There are libertarians who don't see it this way. They just think that we have to establish a private property order and then everything will just fall into place after that. These groups often identify with leftist politics in so much as that they loathe traditional culture and they align themselves with the cultural Marxist movements like feminism, gay and transgender pride, atheism, and egalitarianism. In their mind, once traditional socially conservative culture is destroyed, the state will go in and usher in a new age of diverse, decentralized communities that are full of people who have not yet reversed their cultural Marxist beliefs. At that point, these libertarians think that liberty will prevail. Antonio Gramsci believed that it would usher in communism. I believe it'll usher in a form of libertarianism that furthers the agenda of the top tier elite. A pseudo libertarian revolution could replace the Trotskyite neocons in government and the cultural Marxists in the education institutions. A new libertarian order could emerge, but cultural Marxism would still exist in the minds of the people. The traditional family would still be broken. The mass of single mothers and children without structure would have to find new avenues of support. A stateless society should generally be considered a good thing, but realistically the last 115 years have been disastrous for traditional culture. And this traditional culture must already exist if a private property order is to be maintained. In a culturally Marxist libertarian society, individualism means embracing the ego. Godless and motivated purely by self-interest, a cultural Marxist in this libertarian order cares only for his immediate well-being. And having been raised in a status culture, passes on all the responsibilities of his own life onto the insurance companies and the arboration services that have replaced government bureaucracy. The system is more efficient, cheaper, voluntary, and subject to competition. As well, it gives the individual the ability to travel and to enjoy all kinds of liberties that governments have suppressed for so long. Yet, this person, having being a byproduct of cultural Marxism, lacks the traditional values that come from a traditional family. His values come from the Marxist culture that he's been born into, and it crosses over into the new libertarian order. He's less statist, so he checks out in the libertarian non-aggression department, but socially and culturally, he's still a leftist. This poses a threat to the order, since a compliant population that defers power to the mega corporations will, as the critics contend, revert back into a state. Now this criticism is true if the population has a failing grasp of libertarian principles or remains under the cultural influences of the Western communist intellectuals. All while adhering to the basic non-aggression principle, for-profit companies can still utilize their customers' belief systems and continue with subversive advertising and generally become the be-all and end-all arbitration services. The worst rise to the top whether it be in governments or corporations. And making corporations stand on their own two feet absent government taxation and subsidies is a step in the right direction. But as long as cultural Marxism remains the religion of the day, this libertarian order is only going to serve the power elite. People will be tracked, there will still be surveillance, but on a voluntary basis. A cashless society is possible under a voluntary private property order. As long as the people demand it, it will happen. Big nanny state organizations raising your children while you go to work? As long as it's paid for voluntarily, then go at it. This is the danger a pseudo-libertarian revolution encounters. A successful libertarian anarchist revolution requires that we reverse this long march through the institutions. Otherwise, we're leaving the door open for something even worse. But that doesn't mean we have to work inside the system in order to reverse the damage. What needs to be shown is the moral and economic superiority of the traditional bourgeoisie family model compared to the alternative lifestyles of the communists. Government begins at the local level, but even smaller than community, it begins with the family. And no society that has ever tried to destroy the family has lived to tell about it. 
And that's not to say that everyone must live a certain socially conservative life. Certainly these societies are responsible for some of the largest states, but never should the state be confused with the people, especially democratic ones. Even western states are attacking their own people who hold traditional views. The patriarchy deserves our respect, because all of us, in one way or another, have been a beneficiary of that system. You destroy that, and you destroy civilization. And no amount of voting will ever change that fact. We all want truth. truth. The truth will set you free. free, free.